I think most of you know when I um, prepare songs, I choose the songs normally for the messages and um, I try to make them fit the message. I didn't really, you two, I want you to sit right over here, okay? Would you do that for me? Well, that's all right. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, no, just sit right here on the chairs. It's, it's shady. You're in the sun and I, I don't like it, okay? Uh, you too, Lisette and Victoria. I should have said that. But uh, you can sit closer to your mom if you want. I think you live in the same house, right? Yeah. <laughs> there. Now, is that a little bit cooler? Okay, good. Okay. Uh, I feel better too. <laughs> now, where was I? The, uh, the, the message, as I, as I was singing, I didn't realize how much this song uh, fit the message this morning. I want to read the words to you again because, I mean, we all read them as we were singing, but again, we're trying to carry the tune, and if we don't know the words very well, we're not sure uh, what it's saying. So first of all, he says, How Firm a Foundation. That's the name of the song, probably because it's the first line in the song. Uh, ye saints of the Lord is laid for your faith in his excellent word. So we learn uh, the, the strength of God the, that we can depend on him because he tells us that in his word. Okay. Um, what more can he say than to you he hath said? What more can he say? He said everything he's going to. And he said it's here in the word. To you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. Refuge. Why did we come to Christ? Because we need Him. We accepted Him as our Savior, and we came to Him because He's our refuge. Uh, look at verse 2. Fear not, I am with thee. Oh, be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand, upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. Keep that word in mind, omnipotent, as we look at the message today. God is all-powerful. No matter what comes, and he, he talks about it in the song, whatever comes in our lives, it's because God is working in us and going to help us. When through the deep waters I call thee to go, when God calls us to go through deep waters, the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow. He says, if I, if I have you going through a difficult time, he says, he says I won't let you be over-sorrowful. You know, if, if we are over-sorrowful, whose fault is it? It's our own fault, right? And so he says, I, if you will depend on me, and that's what the foundation is about, uh, the, the not overflow, for I will be with thee, thy troubles to bless. Now that sounds a little bit funny because do you want God to bless your troubles? No, he wants, you, he wants to bless you through your troubles. That's what the song is, is telling us, okay? Uh, and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. He says your deepest distress is going to be made holy because you are being tried like Job was doing, was being tried. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace, all sufficient, shall be thy supply. And that's why we can joy in serving Jesus. Because God is omnipotent and God is always watching over us. The flame shall not hurt thee. I only design thy dross to consume. The dirt and filth that's in the, in the silver and gold that uh, is melted. They scrape off the dross, the junk. Thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose. I will not, I will not desert to his foes. God, Christ is always with us. That's what, this, what the message is going to be talking about today. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Go to Matthew chapter 11 this morning. Matthew chapter 11. Now I'm going to read, the, read what Jesus says here and then we're going to go to other passages and, and see other places in the scripture uh, and, and, and see what, he's, what he means when he says this. Matthew chapter 11, look at verse number 28. Very familiar passage, I think, for most of us. Jesus says, 
Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what you tell us. Thank you for the promises that you have given to us, even as this, what Jesus is talking about himself in the uh, the desire for us to serve you, to come to Christ, and to live according to your words. Lord, I pray that you would give us the knowledge and wisdom that we need as we learn of you, learn from you. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. What I want to look at is the word yoke today. And if you're, some people aren't reading the Bible as I, as I read, and I, I, I mentioned it on the message that you'll see tonight. Her. Her. What's the first, word, first spelling you think of? H-E-R, right? No, that's H-U-R if you're not <laughs> reading the Bible. We'll see that. Here, when I say yoke, that sounds like an egg yolk, but it's not spelled that way. A yoke is something that Usually, okay, usually something that goes around a neck and it is used, when we think of animals, it is used to control, to help control the animal as that, as that animal or those animals carry this yoke. Um, there are two, two main types of yokes, double yokes and single yokes. We even have yokes, I've got to be careful not to pronounce the L in there, it's not an L, there's no L, yoke. Around your collar, does anybody have a shirt on that has a yoke? Anybody know? It goes, it, it's part of the collar. It's a yoke. It goes around your neck. Um, th there's a yoke. If any of you have ever dealt with old-fashioned televisions, you know, we have these flat-screen televisions. There's, there's no picture tube in them anymore. How many of you know what picture tubes are? Uh, there are yokes around the picture tube, and it controls the electrons making the picture. And uh, so there's many different kinds of yokes, but what we want to look at is this type of yoke that is around the yoke of an animal, sometimes around the, uh, did I say around the yoke of an animal? I listen to, I watch the videos and I, and I hear myself making mistakes and I can't correct them. Uh, so if I, if, if I say something wrong, please raise your hand, say that wrong. Um, no, but um, the yoke around the neck, okay, uh, of an animal or, of a person. The, uh, the yoke, the double yoke, is the one we normally think of when we, even reading the Bible, as uh, uh, remember when Elijah found Elisha and uh, to, to pass on the, the mantle of uh, the prophets, being a prophet, he found Elisha plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. Well, <laughs> it's funny, I picture that. How can he drive tw uh, 24 oxen? Now, he probably had several other people helping him drive these oxen, and they were plowing a field probably. And uh, 12 pairs, because they were all yoked together. 12 yoke of oxen. The other yoke is a single yoke, and you might see that on, uh, in, uh, I, I, I want to call them third world countries, where they're using a water buffalo to plow a field. Uh, they'll do that. And uh, there's also a yoke, and you don't see it very much, but it's a yoke that goes across the shoulders of a person. Uh, I think it is called a milkmaid yoke sometimes. You've probably seen the pictures, and I, I want to picture a Dutch girl, and I don't know why Dutch girl, but they carry a, a beam across their shoulder with a bucket of milk on each side. And that's uh, for balance, and that is one of the things we want to look at uh, today. Go over to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. A yoke is used even as a, I, I want to say, a metaphor, a picture of someone being mastered, someone being uh, in bondage. 
1 Timothy chapter 6, look at verse number 1. He says, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and His doctrine be not blasphemed. This was a, a, probably a difficult thing for the people to do at that time. The word servant means a bond slave, somebody who is a slave. He says, count your master as uh, worthy of honor. Why? Because when you do, then you are showing uh, God. You're showing them the, the, the love of God, and you're showing other people God's love in you. He says that the word of God be not blasphemed. In the name of God be not blasphemed. Go over to Ephesians. We use this uh, passage and, and others like it. Um, to point out how we are to treat our employee, employers, even though we're not bond servants, sometimes we might feel like it, <laughs> just with some employers, but the employer, we're getting paid, and we are supposed to treat them with honor and respect. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, and look at verse number 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ not with eye service as men pleasers but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart so being under the yoke does not give us the yoke of, of bondage in this case does not give us the right to dishonor God because we have a bad employer because we have a bad master. Uh, we are to show them the respect that is due them because we are showing Christ. We are doing it for Jesus Christ. When God used the uh, yoke in the scripture, sometimes he talked about bondage to another country. Go over to the book of Deuteronomy, especially when we think of, uh, we know that they were in bondage in Egypt, but after they got out of Egypt, God told them that they are to continue to do his will to be obedient to him otherwise they would go into bondage and he calls it a yoke look at Deuteronomy chapter 28 and look at verse number start at verse number 45 he says moreover all these curses shall come upon thee, and shall pursue thee, and overtake thee, till thou be destroyed, because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. So he says, listen, you need to be obedient. You need to listen to me and follow what I say, um, or these curses will come upon you. And they shall be upon thee for a sign, and for a wonder, and upon thy seed forever. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness. <laughs> you know, I think we skip over that sometimes. Uh, we we want to serve the Lord, right? And sometimes we know what is right to do. And we'll go, we'll go ahead and do it. Or like a child being obedient to a parent. They'll, they'll be quote-unquote obedient, but they're not going to be happy about it. And we are... We are serving the Lord, but we may not be doing it with joy in our hearts. So he says, they didn't do it with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Therefore, shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want or the need of all things and he shall put what a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee so he's not talking about the uh, the other nation coming around a person and putting a yoke of iron you know, you've seen the pictures of collars and they put a, a an iron collar on and then they pull a chain to so that you can't do anything except go where they they pull you this is the idea but it's about the whole nation who are disobedient to God. And he puts a yoke of iron upon them. Go over to Jeremiah. We see this happen to Israel as they 
had to go into captivity because they did not obey God in all things. Jeremiah chapter 28, and look at verse number 13. So God tells Jeremiah to go and tell Hananiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast broken the yokes of wood. Now, Hananiah was another pro a false prophet, and he took the yoke off of uh, uh, the, the, the sign yoke. God, God had Jeremiah put a yoke on himself to show that Israel was going to go into bondage. Hananiah came along and took that yoke and broke it and made a prophecy saying, uh, No, it's not going to happen. Well, now God tells Jeremiah what to do. Thou hast broken the yokes of wood, but thou shalt make for them yokes of iron. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron upon the neck of all these nations, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him. And I have given him the beasts of the field also. So he says, I put Nebuchadnezzar in charge. Don't try to break his yoke off, because I'm the one that put it there on you. But it's Nebuchadnezzar's yoke, the Babylon, uh, the yoke of Babylon. Well, when you think of that, that yoke, that's a, a metaphor for control. When Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, he wants us to put ourselves under his control. He wants us to do his will. He wants us to be obedient to Him. When God, and we're going to look at this, this idea of this uh, <laughs> milkmaid yoke, okay, balance, but let's, uh, let's look at something first. Let's go back to the book of Deuteronomy again, and we'll look at what God set up in the law. And when you look at this, and you read this, sometimes we look at the Old Testament law and I know we, we're, we're, we're a New Testament church because the new covenant uh, God has brought onto, uh, onto the world through Jesus Christ, but we still have examples in the Scripture from the Old Testament. God never destroyed that. Jesus fulfilled the law for us. And so the law is still uh, there that we can look at. Deuteronomy chapter 22, and we look at the law, and we think, what, why did he say that? When you look at uh, something where it says that uh, somebody has stolen something, the punishment was to restore what was stolen and more. And that makes sense to us, right? But then when you look and, and says, now, and God says, don't, uh, when you're walking along the path and you see a nest, uh, you can take the mother but leave the babies. Or one or the other. I get all mixed up. Why? Well, then, and he also says other things. Now, we're going to see one that he says, and you wonder why. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 22, my speaking, and I, verse number 10, I don't get there. He says, and it's, and it's almost all by itself. I mean, there's things around it, but they don't have to do with this. It says, thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together. Okay, did he have a reason for that? Yes, he did, but it might not be the one you might think of. I can think of a, a physical reason. Uh, but if you go a little bit down, we go to the next verse. Okay, I'm going to come back to verse number 10. But look at verse 11. Thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts as of woolen and linen together. <laughs> I can't think of a, a good reason for that, okay? Except for the one I believe God, the reason God put it here. A physical reason. Uh, I don't know that it makes you any hotter or cooler if it's mixed together. Uh, maybe somebody who knows material can do that, but uh, there's really no reason except for the one I'm going to tell you. But verse number 10, I believe there's also, a, you can think of a physical reason why you don't plow with an ox and an ass together. Uh, one is stronger than the other. And if the stronger one keeps pulling, what's going to happen? probably you're going to go around in a circle because the ox is pulling harder and the, the donkey doesn't go and he just goes where the ox goes. And so if you're not careful when you're trying to plow a straight line, 
uh, you'll have to work harder to keep that ox to go this way. You might as well just have one ox. But I don't think that's the reason God put it there. God put it there because it's a picture of inequality. Inequality in what? Well, let's look at it. Let's go over to Revelation. Book of Revelation first. We're going to come back to 2 Corinthians, but go to the book of Revelation chapter 6. And in this case, what we're going to see is not necessarily the meaning of the verse, but what God says in the verse and what He uses there. Revelation chapter 6 and verse number, we'll start at verse number 5. And when He had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Okay, here's a picture of this person on a black horse carrying a pair of balances. Now, we, when we have to weigh something, we go stand on a scale or put something on a scale. And the things have been d designed in a different way than what they had in the Old Testament. And I think I, I've mentioned it before, but it's a balance that is equal. The arms are equal weight and the plates are equal or you might have to make an adjustment on it so that it sits equal. Well, if you put a penny on one or a three measures of barley on one and a measure of wheat, they're supposed to balance. He's really saying you balance it and, and each one is going to be equal value, one penny. So the pair of balances was, was the point. That is one Greek word, and it is the same word that Jesus uses in Matthew 11. The translators wouldn't say, uh, take my pair of balances upon you. Okay, he says, take my yoke. It's a yoke. It's a pair of balances. It's the same word. And so we, we see what a yoke is in a balance or in equality. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6. God wants us to be yoked in the right way. And there's two things we want to look at mainly today. Yoking, that Jesus Christ said, take my yoke upon you. And then Paul tells us, and God tells us in, through Paul, do not be unequally yoked. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 14. He says, be ye not unequally yoked together. Now that, that again is another one Greek word. And it means the whole, th whole thing, unequally yoked. But it's the same uh, word that is used to mean yoke. So don't be unequally yoked. Be balanced together with unbelievers. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. So he says, come out from among them. He says, don't be linked or yoked together with unbelievers. He also tells us to be separated from disobedient Christians. God does not want us yoked unequally, and that's why He told the Israelites, do not plow with an ox and an ass together. It's unequal. It's, it's showing a picture. Okay? It, it wasn't really, I don't think it was about the uh, 
ox going the wrong way or anything. I think it was because he's making this picture, and that's why the next verse, don't wear linen and woolen together. It's the picture of being separated. God wants us to be his peculiar people. He wants us to be righteous, and we need to be separated from anything that is unrighteous. Not to be yoked together with the world. Not to be yoked together with disobedient brothers or unbelievers. We are to be yoked together with believers who are desiring to walk with the Lord. Who are doing what they believe and what they see in Scripture that is right before God. Living for the Lord. When we are correctly yoked together with believers... And we are correctly yoked together with Christ. By the way, when you think of the yoke that Christ is saying, uh, take my yoke upon, he, upon you. Is he saying, talking about a double yoke or a single yoke? Now again, I'm sounding like an egg. <laughs> double yoke or single. I believe he's talking about a double yoke. If it were a single yoke, then it would seem like we are walking alone. But I would rather be yoked together with Christ. Yes, he's a lot more powerful than me, but we're not going to go in circles. He's going to make sure he's helping me carry my load. And he can carry us together. And that's why he says, take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. I am meek and lowly of heart. That, means, that, that, that doesn't mean learn about him. Well, it means learn about him, but learn from him. Learn from him. He says, I am meek and lowly in heart. How should we be? We are to be like Him. We are to be meek and lowly in heart. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. When Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, I believe He's contrasting His burden, His, his yoke, His commandments with the Jewish leaders. Go over to Matthew chapter 23. Now, he might be talking about it a long time after he talks about his yoke. Okay, we see it from Matthew 11 all the way to Matthew 23. And uh, we, we might think that, well, he, why, why, why would you say he's contrasting what he said in Matthew 23? Well, the Jewish people knew what the, he was telling it. He knew it. In Matt, they knew it in Matthew 11. We might not know it until Matthew 23. But the Jewish people knew it. When he says, Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, uh, or ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Well, look at Matthew 23. And compare that, verse number starting in verse number 1, compare that with the Jewish uh, religious leaders. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All, therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne. And lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. He says, look, their, their burdens are, are heavy. They're grievous. They're not fun. They tell you, uh, uh, they show you the way to go. They tell you to do these things, but they're not willing to do it. And of course, they made up a lot of their own rules. He says, go ahead and do what they say. But he says, but if you take my yoke upon you, you take my burdens on you, they're light. They're easy. Can you imagine carrying a burden? You know, when, when I've, I've heard people say this. I, uh, I was saved when I was seven years old, so I didn't have a great big burden, okay? But people tell me when they have said, when they come to faith in Christ later on, when they're in their 20s or 30s, they say it feels like a burden has been lifted off their shoulders. Maybe that's happened to you. But that's what happens. Jesus says, I'm going to take 
your burdens. I'm going to carry them for you. Go over to 1 Peter. First Peter chapter 5, and look at verse number, let's start at verse 6. He said, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Verse number 6 says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for for you. I like to emphasize the four. You don't need to carry your burden. Christ wants to carry it for you. He cares for you, and He will care in your place. He will care for you. His burden is light. His commandments, I think it's John that says it, His commandments are not grievous. We might think, oh, it's so hard. This Christian life sometimes is so hard. Who makes it hard? <laughs> Don't point your finger at me. Okay, I, I'll say I make it hard. Okay. For me. Christ doesn't make it hard for me. It must be myself. Because I don't cast all my cares on Him. I try to handle things myself. When he says, take my yoke upon you, he says, listen, just come under my wing. Just come and put yourself with me. Yoke up with me. I, I'm not going to carry you around in circles. I'm going to help you carry your load. I'll carry you with me. You've, you've probably all seen that poem, and I don't know the poem, but the Footprints in the Sand, where... The guy had dreams and he sees his footprints with Jesus' footprints in the sand. And he says he walks through his life and every time uh, trouble comes, he only sees one footprint, one pair of footprints. And then things get better and he sees two again. He says, Lord, why did you leave me? Every time I had trouble, it was like you left me. He says, no, that's when I carried you. And so he carries us. He carries us through. Our burden will be light when we cast our cares on God, on Christ. Go over to Mark chapter 4. When we are to cast all our cares on Him, what are they? Well, they're cares of this world. Mark chapter 4, we've, we've, we've looked at this many times, maybe not in Mark, but uh, what Jesus is talking about, He's talking about this parable of the sower. And He says this about some people. And it, sometimes it's us, okay? Okay. Verse number 18, and these, are, and these are they which are sown among the thorns, such as hear the word. And the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. Now look, we, we, we look at this, and, and we don't want to look at this and say, okay, I, well, I'm not worried about riches. It's not deceitful to me. I don't follow riches. Maybe not. Some people do. Okay, he's not talking about one person who has all of these, these things going on. But the cares of this world. How many of you, be honest with me, how many of you think about life? <laughs> how many of you eat? Okay, if you don't, <laughs> if you're not eating, something's wrong. Um, we have cares in this world, don't we? So at least we, we all can are susceptible to the cares of this world. And if we aren't careful in thinking about the things of this world, we begin to worry. Some people worry so much they go into depression. Some people don't know how to cast their cares on the Lord. How do we do that? It's up to each one of us. We've got to just recognize God wants to help us. We've re we looked at God as our succorer, a month or so, two months ago. 
I forgot how long we've been meeting out here and all this stuff is going on. But we can go back to the video and look at it, I'm sure. God is our helper. He wants to be with us. He wants to help us. Jesus said, And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. When is Jesus going to leave us? Never. We need to recognize that. We need to stay close in recognition to Him. Go over to Psalm 118. Psalm 118. And look at verse number 6. <laughs> the Lord is on my side. Now, when we think of that yoke, uh, Jesus is on one side and you're on the other. Wait a minute. He says, the Lord's on my side. You don't say get back on your own side. He's on my side too. He's carrying the load. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. Does he say, I might not fear? I will not fear. Why? Because the Lord is on his side. And he says, what can man do unto me? Think about man. I, you know, a lot of things in this life is not because of a person doing something against you. What he's telling us here is, is man is a physical being, so all these things around us are physical things. What can happen to me that God isn't going to watch over me? Nothing. Go over to uh, Psalm 56. Psalm 56. Now we saw the Lord is on my side, right? Psalm 56. I'm, I'm only showing you a few places, okay? The Bible is full of things talking about God being with us and helping us out. Psalm 56, look at verse number 9. When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know. So he says what, what he just said. I know this. My enemy, en enemies will turn back. This I know, for God is for me. God is for me. God is not against me. He's for me. Who is God? Who is God? And He's telling us this, that He is for us. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He's the one that died for us. We put our faith in Christ. He comes and lives within us. The Holy Spirit is in us. Who is God? And when I say God is for me, what do I really know about that? Go over to Isaiah 51. Isaiah 51. And look at verse number 12. I, even I, am He that comforteth you. That's God talking to us, right? He comforts us. Who art thou? that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die. <laughs> God's not going to die, right? He's always with you. And of the Son of Man, which shall be made as grass, and forgettest the Lord thy Maker, that hath stretched forth the heavens, and laid the foundations of the earth, and has feared, and you, basically, he's, he's, there's a semicolon there after earth, right? Now he changes the... The voice, and it's he's talking about the person he's talking to, and has feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor, as if he were ready to destroy. I put an emphasis there that you don't see in the scripture. You were afraid, like that guy's going to destroy you, the oppressor. He says, and where is the fury of the oppressor? I created the heavens and the earth. I am for you. Who's going to be against you? Who's going to be able to fight against me when I'm on your side? Wow. <laughs> that, that is God, our creator, God, our savior. And Jesus, God in the flesh, says, come unto me. 
all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Wow, if we would just depend on God like that, what kind of cares would we have? What kind of sorrows that, that we would have we couldn't go through? No, God is on our side. And the yoke of Christ is a peaceful yoke of rest. To take His yoke, to go with Him, along with Him, He carries our load. He'll never leave us, never forsake us. His commandments are not hard. They're not grievous. Because He helps, them, helps us do them if we rely on Him. We can be at rest and peace carrying His yoke. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the yoke of Jesus Christ. Thank You that we can put His yoke on and let Him direct our way. Lord, the whole Scripture is telling us to let You control, let You direct our steps. Steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and light unto my path. We know that you direct us. And I pray that you would help us to not only be directed by you, but be comforted by you. I am the one who comforteth you, you said. Lord, I pray that you would give us your strength to go daily in the power of Jesus Christ, the strength that He has to guide us, direct us, to carry our burdens and our loads. Thank you for teaching us these things. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. Turn to number 26. Number 26. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord unto me. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you again for the love you've shown us, the mercy that you have shown us, the grace. We thank you for carrying us, caring for us. We ask you for your guidance now this day. Lord, help us to honor you in our life. And Lord, give us the strength to go daily this week, serving you and to bringing us back together uh, next Sunday. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.